Right guys, so I'm going to be reviewing the boxing that happened over the weekend with the Day of Reckoning and the boxing that happened on Boxing Day with Nero Yuanue beating uh, Marlon Tapales. So first I'm going to start off with the first fight on the Day of Reckoning card, which I believe was uh, Frank Sanchez jun versus Junior Farr. Uh, Junior Farr looked quite impressive. I thought... Um, I thought Frank Sanchez would dominate it a lot more, but he had quite a low punch output, but I still think he controlled the fight throughout. Uh, obviously, Frank Sanchez won by knockout, is a big right hand. He land, he dropped Junior Farr a couple of times with big right hands, and an impressive performance by Frank Sanchez. I thought he could have potentially gone through the gears a bit earlier and got Junior Farr out of there, but it was a good experience for him to fight in Saudi Arabia and get some rounds against a decent level opponent. As I said, Junior Farr did a lot better than what I thought he would do. After he's lost on points to Joseph Parker, we're going to speak about later. And he's also lost by knockout to Lucas Brown. Losing to um, Joseph Parker isn't that... Like, in young stages of a heavyweight's career, losing to Joseph Parker, that's a good learning experience. But losing to Lucas Brown when he's in his 40s that's when you start to think are they that good but i think junior far did put in a good performance and i'm looking forward to seeing what happens with junior far next obviously i'm looking forward to seeing what happens to the winner frank sanchez next um i'd like to see him move on through the ranks now he's probably a top 10 heavyweight now and he does need to uh fight a better level of opposition than what he has been fighting i'd say his best opponent's probably still fa jagba and he fought fa jagba he fought FA Jagba in 2021, which shows he's had two years of fighting, not the best level of opposition. He's a promising talent. <coughs> he's got good power, which he showed against... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, he showed good power against Junior Far. He showed good timing against Junior Far, good hand speed against Junior Far. But I still think he needs to move up the level of competition. I'd like to see Frank Sanchez fight... Uh, one of the other heavyweights on this card, potentially a uh, Caballero, who I'm going to speak about in a bit, or um, a Dillian White, potentially, depends on how his drug test results go and everything gets sorted out with that. Uh, but the one guy I'm going to say is... The one guy for... Uh, Frank Sanchez would be I'm gonna say Andy Ruiz I think that'd be a really good fight for Frank Sanchez I really want to see Andy Ruiz in the ring some point in 2024 and he hasn't fought since I think mid 2022 so I'd like to see him against Frank Sanchez because I don't really want to see Ruiz go in with one of the big fights straight away because his inactivity means I don't think he's worthy of it at the moment. I think the more active heavyweights should fight the top five. Uh, but if Andy Ruiz could get a win against Frank Sanchez, he deserves to be fighting the top five fighters. Um, yeah, I want to see Frank Sanchez fight Andy Ruiz next. I think they're both Showtime fighters. Well, not Showtime fighters, uh, PBC fighters. Uh, so it would be good to see what happens with the Amazon deal and then it would be good to see them fight some point next year. I'd love to see that fight. Uh, then we've got, it was Philip Hergovic against uh, Demoy, Mark Demoy, I think it was. Uh, absolute one-sided beat down in the first round. Like As soon as Philip Hergovic landed a right hand, he dropped Demoy and then it wasn't even a hard right hand, I don't think. And then he just Demore just turned his back and just he quit on himself really um i said uh in the preview for this fight that Demore should be nowhere near it fighting philip hergovic and so it showed on the night uh philip hergovic just he's just levels and levels and levels above um mark Demore and philip hergovic just needs to go through the levels a bit um he He's obviously mandatory for the IBF, um, which means he's number one. If if the belt gets vacated by U the Usyk Fury winner, which it 
potentially could do because they've got a rematch clause so they won't be able to fight the mandatory straight away uh, that would mean that the fight would be Philip Hergovic against Anthony Joshua which I'm going to speak about later and I think that is probably the fight to make Philip Hergovic against Anthony Joshua I'd like to see that fight uh, get Anthony Joshua or Philip Hergovic a belt and then potentially get the fight against the Fury Usyk winner I think that'd be really good I think um yeah, my early prediction for that would be an anti-Joshua anti win, but we'd have to see if the fight gets made. And yeah, it's not too much really to speak about Filip Hergovic, except it was a terrible mismatch. Um, Mark Demori should never have been in the ring against Filip Hergovic, and that's what I can say really about the fight. It wasn't... Yeah, that's what I can say. And then we've then got Jaya Pattaya against Ellis Zorro. Jai Obtaya, first round knockout, amazing, honestly. Elisor looked quite composed, I'd say, in the first round. He looked... Um, he wasn't winning the fight at all. Like, he wasn't winning the round. Uh, Jai Obtaya obviously won the round, but... Yeah, Jai Obtaya, that big left hook, that looping left hook, honestly, that is a problem for cruiserweights. Um, obviously, because he's, he's a southpaw, he can land it easier. Um... He dips to his right and then throws that left hand, which gets in between the gap of an orthodox fighter's guard. Um, I think... Or I like how Jaya Pattaya is like constantly bouncing on his feet. He's got like a good spring in his step, I think. And um, that enables, enab enables him sorry, to get in and out of distance. Um, he set up that left hook really well. He was constantly going to the body, uh, jabs to the body, backhand to the body, even did one twos to the body, uh, and then he started going with straight upstairs, uh, a straight left hand upstairs, which then meant when he so he would go to the body, then he'd go to the head with that straight left hand, but then that meant that Ellis Zorro, when Jaya Pattaya went to the body, he'd bring his guard slightly in, which left the area open for him to uh, knock him out. Obviously, in the first round, impressive power by Jaya Pattaya. Um, and I'm really excited to see what happens with Jaya Pattaya next. I'd like to see Jaya Pattaya fight Chris Benham smith I think Jaya Pattaya is the best in the division, even though he doesn't have the IBF belt anymore because of everything that happened with all of the Brader situation. I'd like to... Well, ideally, I'd probably like to see Jaya Pattaya fight Bradis in March for the IBF belt, but I don't think the IBF are going down that route. I think they're going to give Bradis the next available contender for some reason, which I think should be Jaya Pattaya, but we'll have to see what happens with that. If he can't fight uh, Maris Bradis, I would like to see him fight Chris Bullen Smith. I think those two are definitely the best in the division, and I think Jaya Pattaya would probably win that fight. I like Jaya Pattaya's style. It's a lot. It's, he's constantly moving, good footwork, in and out of range. And I'm just excited for him to fight who I think is probably the second best in the division in Chris Bilham Smith. Um, yeah, exciting fight, exciting future for Jaya Pattaya. One of the fav my favourite fighters at the moment. And if he can rack a couple more wins together, get a good level of position like Chris Bilham Smith, like Richard Riappel, like Lance Coley, maybe even get another belt against a Bradis or someone like that. Um, I think he's got to be on the pound for pound ranking soon. He's got pound for pound talent, he just doesn't have a pound for pound resume, a bit like Javante Davis. I think he's got good talent, but he doesn't have a pound for pound resume like the people like Devin Haney do, like the people like Tanch Crawford do, the people like Anoue do. Um, yeah, just load that resume up a bit and then he'll be in the top 10 pound for pound because he is a special talent and I love watching Jaya Pattaya. Then after that was Makhmadov against Kabayel. Um... Wow, uh, big. That that was an upset. I think uh, Mac. I thought Makhmadov was going to win this fight. I've never seen Kabayel before, but I heard that he had a negative style, and he was going like Makhmadov. I rated his aggression. I liked um, his power, but watching the fight, Kabayel was just a much superior boxer. I feel like, and I feel like those body shots took out of Makhmadov. He. He looked like he didn't have much stamina, like, at all. And that's just caused by the body shots, I guess, unless he really doesn't have any stamina. Um, I loved Cabiel's 
body shots, like I just said. Um, he really impressed me, Cabiel, to be fair. Um, I didn't expect that from him. Cabiel's... He just punched in combinations. Early rounds, he kept moving, like kept throwing body shots, and then Makhmadov started to tire out. And it was just a great performance by Cabiel. Really surprising for me, because I thought... Uh, Makhmadov was going to be one of the next guys after Joshua Fury Usyk retire. He could still be, he could come back, get a couple wins, but that performance raised some alarm bells about his cardio, about his just ability in general. I think he looked a bit sluggish, he looked a bit, um, his footwork looked like he was plodding a bit, he didn't have fast feet, uh, so much to improve on for Makhmadov. But Kabiel really showed those weaknesses in Makhmadov, which you need to praise Kabiel for, really. It was an amazing performance, shock performance, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, good. it would be good to see what happens next for Makhmadov. Uh, I'd like to see Makhmadov... No, sorry, not Makhmadov. It would be interesting to see what happens next for Kabiel. I'd like to see Kabiel move up in opponents. Uh, potentially a... Deontay Wilder, it could be. I wouldn't mind seeing a Deontay Wilder fight against Cabiel. Because um, he needs to drop down in levels after his loss to Joseph Parker, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And Cabiel deserves to move up in levels, I guess. Deontay Wilder could potentially be a Jared Anderson again. It could like He's potentially the weakest at the top 10 heavy, at heavyweight. And I wouldn't be surprised if top rank put some money together for that fight. Um... So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say Deontay Wilder, put Cabello in there with Deontay Wilder, see how that goes. Um, yeah, it'd be good to see Cabello move up in levels and he deserves to move up in levels, to be honest, after that performance. For Makhmadov, potentially a fight against Jared Anderson, I know I say, I'm say i saying Jared Anderson a lot, but I really like Jared Anderson and I would like to see him move up through the levels. Um, I think Makhmadov, I think he's uh, Jared Anderson's taken a bit of a step back after his Martin fight, uh, but um, I guess Makhmadov would be a level up and I'd like to see that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say Makhmadov against Jared Anderson, I think. Then we've got Dimitri. No, it was Biv. Uh, not Bivol. Um, Bua, not Bua, see what am I saying? Dubois against Miller. Um, Dubois dug deep. Like that is probably the best performance I've ever seen from Daniel Dubois. Uh, Joel Miller just constantly walking him down. Uh, high guard, constantly just trying to get to him, throw loads of punches. Not much technique, but I don't... Yeah, there wasn't much technique from Joel Miller, but Daniel Dubois dug deep when he was probably quite tired to get the stoppage in, I think it was the last 10 seconds of the 10th round. Um, great performance by Daniel Dubois. Kept moving, kept uh, Joel Miller at range uh, with his big um, straight hands. So he's going jab, Backhand, he's doing body shots, uh, powerful body shots. I liked his body shots, kept to keep Joel Miller away from him. And Joel Miller seemed to be a bit tired. I think that there's been a lot of speculation after the fight that could potentially be because he's not using drugs anymore, performance enhancing drugs. I wouldn't say that's untrue. That's what I'm going to say. Um, so, yeah, great performance by Daniel Dubois. Uh, and he's got a lot of options now. I think the label as a quitter for Daniel Dubois needs to slightly go away now. I feel like that was a very good performance. Um, he got I Well, I wouldn't say he got tired early, but I'd say he started to fatigue a bit quite early, but he still dug deep. I'd like to see him move up in level of competition. Uh, he did dominate Jarrell Miller. But I think Jarrell Miller's not as good as potentially we thought going into the fight. Because he hadn't fought any good level of opposition. I did say Daniel Dubois probably would win. Um, and I think Daniel Dubois 
great performance. I'd like to see Daniel Dubois fight Joe Joyce. I think now that Joe Joyce has lost to Zaylee Zhang, I'd like to see Daniel Dubois get that one back. I'd like to see... It's an in-house fight. I think they're both Queensbury fighters. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the fight that's made next. I wouldn't be surprised if Frank Wong gave Joe Joyce quite a bit of money in order to entice him to take the Daniel Dubois fight. And I would be excited for that fight. I think Dubois might win now. I think Joe Joyce... I don't know if it's just how good Zhang is and how powerful Zhang is or whether his chin's gone a bit because of how much punishment he's taken in the lead-up to the Zhang fight. Uh, but it'd be good to see. It'd be good to see how Daniel Dubois improved, because I think he has. And it'd be good to see if Joe Joyce is still on that level everyone thought he was before the Zhang fights. Um, then we've got Bivol against Lyndon Arthur. Uh, Dimitri Bivol dominated Lyndon Arthur over 12 rounds, outpointed him. Um... I think he won every round. He got a 10-8 round in the 11th round because he obviously knocked Lyndon Arthur down with a body shot. Um, yeah, it was probably one of Bivol's less entertaining performances for casual, I'd say. But for the boxing purists, I think it was a good performance. Good technical performance, used his jab well. I would say he was using too many headshots. He went head hunting, like the commentary said quite a bit. Um... He did need to try and drop down to the body a bit. And when he did drop down to the body, he got Lyndon off a hurt and dropped in the 11th round, like I said. Um, I think... I think Bivol needs to fight a high level of competition for him to produce his best performances, like against Canelo, Zuda Ramirez and Joe Smith, probably. But it was still a good performance, I thought. I felt like it was... He didn't take too many risks because he doesn't want to lose his position. He's now won the IBO belt, uh, which he made quite a big thing of leading into the fight, which if he like if he wants the IBO belt, then that's, I guess it's another belt he's got now. He's got the WBA and the IBO now. IBO is not really seen as a proper world championship, but it's a good, you'd rather have it than not have it. Um, I think... Lyndon Arthur also made it difficult for Bivol. Lyndon Arthur's got long reach. He's got a good jab as well as Bivol's got a good jab. Um, he const he was moving uh, around the outside of the ring to stop Bivol being able to unleash combinations on him when he stood still. He stood still in the later half of the... Well, not stood still. Like He was holding his feet a bit more in the later half of the fight when I think he knew that he was getting outpointed and also Bivol's body shots in the latter half of the fight probably got to him a bit got him a bit tired i liked Lyndon arthur's bravery i think that probably was questioned a bit after the anthony yard fight but he took a lot of punishment i'd say against bivol and credit to him um i like Lyndon arthur i like him a lot i think he's got a bright future like i said in the preview for this it's just unfortunate for like the brits that are at one uh, 175 pounds because it's just the champions. They're always they're always amazing champions at £175. You've got Peterbiev, you've got Bivol, you've got Canelo's had it previously, you've got Kovalev, you've got Andre Ward, you've got Roy Jones Jr. It's just, you've had so many great champions at the £175, £175 weight category, sorry. But it's just hard for them. I think Lyndon Arthur would potentially win a title in like the middleweight division or something because it's not as strong. Um, if he was smaller, obviously, but it's just difficult for them, and it's nothing against Lyndon Arthur's ability. It's just how good Dimitri Bivol is, and he's a pound for pound great, and you, you can't doubt that he is technically one of the best boxers in the world. And I really want to see him fight the winner of Baturbiev and uh, Callum Smith. I think the Saudis will put money into that fight. I think. That is the fight to make. Uh, obviously, the WBC and Maurizio Solomon have said they won't allow Russian fighters to fight for their belts, which I think is because of political reasons, which I don't think is fair at all because Bivol's not doing anything 
wrong. He's just boxing. I don't see why he can't fight for the undisputed title. Um, but yeah, it's just I really want to see that fight. Um, yeah, that'd be the fight I'd say next for Bivol. For Lyndon Arthur, I'd say um, Craig Richards. I know that fight was being spoken about before he took the Dimitri Bivol fight. Um, so yeah, I'd say potentially a Craig Richards fight on a matchroom card or a Channel 5 card. I'd like to see that. I think that'd be a good domestic fight. And the winner goes on to potentially challenge him for a world title if... Yeah, potentially challenge for a world title in the future. Um, once some belts get vacated, potentially, because I think they eventually will if Bivo and Baterbiev do fight each other. Because I think the winner of that might move up to cruiserweight to challenge themselves. And yeah, I can't wait to see what happens for both boxers later in, oh, in 2024. Uh, for it was a, Joseph Parker against Deontay Wilder was the co-main event. Uh, Joseph Parker, I thought that was a massive upset in beating Deontay Wilder, to be honest with you. I thought coming off the back of the Joe Joyce fight, coming off the back of just the beating that he took in that Joe Joyce fight, I thought Deontay Wilder would be able to land at least one big right hand and potentially knock him out. But I was proven wrong. Deontay Wilder didn't look at his sharpest. He didn't look as good as he has previously, but that's not taking anything away from Joseph Parker because at the end of the day, he's one of two people that have beaten um, Deontay Wilder. In the lead-up to the fight, Deontay Wilder was speaking a lot about Anthony Joshua. I don't think I heard him talk much about Joseph Parker, so he could have been overlooking Joseph Parker. But also, his his demeanour sort of changed. Like, his... Um, I don't know how to describe it. Like, his... He seems much happier in life, much more content, which... I like, obviously you don't want people to be unhappy and struggle in life, but like on his way up, he had like a point to prove, he had, he just wanted to knock everyone out, he spoke about wanting to decapitate people, and like, he said he wanted a body on his record, now he's not saying stuff like that, like he cried in the post fight of the Hellenius fight, he's, he seems to be much more emotional now, which isn't a bad thing, uh, he seems to... Yeah, he just doesn't seem the same person as what he once was. He's mentioned that in the post-fight as well. Uh, he said he's not going to retire, which would be good. I want to see Wilder get back in the ring and fight someone else. Try and be a bit more active. He reminds me a bit of what people have been saying about, and me, uh, uh, have been saying about Anthony Joshua recently, where he's like sort of not throwing as many punches and he's a bit afraid to pull the trigger a bit. I wouldn't say he's afraid, obviously, but, like, he's reluctant, potentially, because of his wars with Tyson Fury. Um, yeah, I think he just... Yeah, he just seems a bit more reluctant to throw. When he did throw, I think he... It was, const it was very consistent. Like, you could tell what Wilder was going to throw. It's a big... 1-2, and that was nearly all he was throwing. If he thinks he got Parker hurt, he might just throw some wild punches, but he never really got Parker hurt. Parker threw some big overhands and hurt Wilder, if anything. I liked how he was dipping to his left and throwing a big right hand as he did it, uh, which caught Wilder plenty of times. Um, when Wilder was throwing his right hand, he would like try and clinch him just before or not clinch him he'd probably he'd like move into Wilder before he could get that right hand off which meant he couldn't generate as much power and the trajectory of the right hand wasn't aiming for Joseph Park Parker's face like it was initially intended to I assume from Wilder um but yeah Wilder um not Wilder Parker fought a really smart fight and it was the best performance of his career by far and yeah I'm excited to see what happens next for Parker I'd like to see him fight Wilder was going to fight Anthony Joshua. I don't think Anthony Joshua... I think Anthony Joshua was going to fight Filip Herkovic for the IBF belt. That's just what I personally think. He might not. He might fight Parker. He might still fight Wilder. But I think Joshua's going to go down the IBF route, which I'll speak about further in a minute. Um, but I think 
Joseph Parker could fight Zaylee Zhang. I'd like to see Zaylee Zhang fight. Um, and then the winner of that could fight for another belt. I think Zaylee Zhang's the WBO interim title holder, which means if the belt gets vacated, he'll be the WBO champion. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if... So the winner of that would definitely be mandatory for the WBO. I wouldn't be surprised if the WBO gets vacated at the end of next year, potentially, if Fury and Usyk have a rematch. I'd like to see... Uh, Zayli Zhang against Joseph Parker for me now they're both in the top 5 heavyweights for me it's Usyk Fury number 1 and number 2 I think Usyk's probably number 1 and then Joshua off the back of his performance against Otto Wallin and then Zhang and then Parker uh, I just put Zhang ahead of Parker because Zhang beat Joe Joyce where Parker lost to Joe Joyce but I'd like to see the fight. I, 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 that'd be one of the fights I really want to see in 2024. And yeah, and for Wilder, I'd, I think I said Cabiel for Wilder earlier. So I'd like, I'd just say Wilder against Cabiel. I think that would make sense. Or potentially Wilder against Frank Sanchez. I think any three of those, like if any three of those could fight each other. I know I said someone else for um, Frank Sanchez earlier, but I'd like to see those three fight each other either way they can. Um, or even four, throw Andy Ruiz in there, just do a round robin of those four, I think. Those four are just outside the top the top five. So yeah, just get those going. Uh, then the co or, sorry, the main event of the evening was obviously Joshua against Wallin. I spoke previously about Joshua being reluctant to throw, a bit like Wilder was. But Joshua, honestly, that performance was one of the best I've seen of Joshua. Um, it was, I'd say it goes back to 2018 when he fought uh, Alexander Povetkin. It's that sort of performance, like it's before everything happened with Andy Ruiz. And I think a lot of credit there goes to Ben Davison. Ben Davison... I'm starting to rate him more and more as a trainer. He, after you see what he's done with Lee Woods, the impact he's had on his career, um, the impact he's had on Shabazz Masood, he's just had. He's starting to be a really good trainer, in my opinion, and you need to start speaking about him as one of the elite British trainers. I think um, it's just amazing what the impact. From that Hellenius fight to the Wallin fight, Joshua's made so many improvements. He throws more punches. He, it was, it was. I know a lot of people have said it, but it was nearly punch perfect. A punch perfect performance, nearly. He wasn't reluctant to throw at all. He he showed power. He rocked Otto Wallin a couple times. Wallin was a bit. He liked to stand and trade with Joshua a bit, which I don't understand why, because I think Joshua is a much bigger puncher, which he showed. He didn't actually knock Wallin down, but it was a, a corner stoppage after the fifth round, between the fifth and sixth round. Joshua's performance was honestly one of the best since 2018. It's better than any performance that he's done. And that takes him up to the third best heavyweight, in my opinion. Potentially the second best heavyweight. I'd like to see him and Tyson Fury fight at uh, some point. Potentially next Riyadh season. Um, yeah, excited for what's next for Anthony Joshua. It's just, he threw in combin... Well, I'd like to see him throw a bit more in combinations. But he just, he f started to throw in combinations. His, his jab seemed much quicker. Like, after... About 30 seconds of the first round, you could see Anthony Joshua just looked different. Like, he looked different compared to what his last couple of fights have been like. And it's just amazing to see the improvements he's made. Uh, he looks much more aggressive. I don't know if that was because of how aggressive he was. Well, not aggressive. How um, blunt he was with the media. I don't know if that was why his performance was so good. But I want to see more of it. I want to see... Joshua, I think it would be a much better fight against Usyk now. Um, I would just love to see him fight Fury, Usyk. I want to see him fight the top guys at heavyweight. I'd like to see him fight Zeli Zhang. I'd like to see him fight Joseph Parker. 
But the one name I'm going to say is Filip Hergovic. I think Filip Hergovic will fight Joshua for the IBF belt. I think it might get vacated by the winner of Usyk versus Fury. I'd just love to see that fight. I love. I think Joshua win that fight pretty comfortably. I think I don't rate Hergovic that highly. Um, I'm just yeah, Joshua next year. I want to see him have at least two fights because the more activity he's having, the better he looks, and you can see the progress in his performances. His performance against Jermaine Franklin to his performance against Hellenius. I would I wouldn't say big improvements, but you can see improvements. And then his performance from Hellenius to um, Otto Wallin, even, e even better performance. And I can't wait to see what happens with him next. Um, yeah, him against Hergovic is the fight to make, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I'd love to see that fight. I think next for Otto Wallin, uh, he might need to take a bit of a step back in competition, obviously. I think... Him against Dillian White would be a good fight. Um, Dillian White, obviously, good. Well, he's a good boxer. Um, I don't have him in my top 10 at heavyweight anymore. He obviously failed a drugs test midway through this year. Uh, depending on what happens with that, potentially an Otto Wall and Dillian White fight. I know they were scheduled to box in October of 2021. But White pulled out of that fight because of an injury. So I'd like to see them potentially get that fight back on. That'd be a fight I'd say for Otto Wallin. Uh, and then, for that's it for the Day of Reckoning card. And the final fight that I'm going to review is Inoue versus Tapales. Inoue is now the undisputed £122 super bantamweight title holder. Just over a year after beating Paul Butler to become the undisputed 118 pound bantamweight champion which is just an amazing it's an amazing feat to like move up in weight and then beat Tapales and Fulton who Fulton I ranked nearly in my top 10 pound for pound at the time and he just dominated Fulton in over seven rounds just dominated him and now that he's knocked Tapales out in the 10th round Honestly, great performance. I loved his body shots. I loved his power. I loved his speed. I loved his combinations, his footwork. He is just a special, special talent. He's still number two in my pound for pound, unfortunately. I'd say he needs to move up in weight for him to be the pound for pound king. Or fight at Madeley Evan Lewis Neri. Um, or Terence Crawford for tyres, obviously or loses a rematch to Earl Spence or something like that along those lines. I think he's just special. Like His power for that division is insane. I think he's going to land at £130 in the future. I think that'll be where he stops moving up in weight. Um, I loved his body shots. He's got, like, like I said, he's just an amazing, amazing boxer and he was testing the fight, to be fair. Like, Tapales probably gave him the best fight that he's had since the first Anito Donaire fight. He was pushing him back a bit. Like, Inoue was not on the ropes, but he had to move around the ring a bit because Tapales was giving it to him. Um, yeah, a good performance by Tapales, to be fair, as well. But Inoue is just a special, special talent. He's, he's so good, and he needs to be talked about as well he's I would say he's definitely a Hall of Famer but his career is legendary I think he started off at 105 pounds he's gone up to 122 pounds he's won four he's won titles in four weight classes that's just it's unbelievable what he's managed to do in such a short space of time like yeah, a new A. I can't wait to see a new A in his next fight. I hope he moves up and weight to 126 pounds. But he said that he wants to fight Lewis Neri, I think, at 122 pounds, which I'm not mad at. I like that fight. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna say uh, fight Lewis Neri. Um, yeah, I ca I can't wait for what's next for a new A. It's just his hand speed. Like his hand speed is like, it's ridiculous compared to the other fighters. 
he's able to see the punch coming so quickly. And like everyone in those lighter weight classes are rapid, but Inoue is able to see it, get out of the way quickly, and then come back and like with a power punch. And it's not a light punch, it's a power punch. Like, it's ridiculous. I think, yeah, I'm going to say next for Inoue, Lewis Neri. And next for Topales, um... I don't know who's next for Topalis, to be honest with you. I, if, if, if a new way for Ahmed Aliyev, I'd say Topalis versus Neri. I would rather a new way fights Ahmed Aliyev. So I'm going to say a new way versus Ahmed Aliyev, Neri against Topalis. Um, yeah, can't wait for those fights. Um, if they get made, obviously. 